<laughs> no, and then and then I said, oh, I have to go and listen to this meeting and. Um, yeah, and um, Bob's, you know, he's done, a, he set up a little, uh, a presentation, he's going to talk about low heel, long toe, sorry, um, and uh, like I said, um, the internet's knocked, been knocked out. Uh, oh, uh, Diana, I go over, I'm going to go over pad densities on Friday, so join that one. Um, okay, great. People have been giving me suggestions about um, who to have as future guests, so been working on that but <laughs> I wanted to have you back um and I know you've you know Martina and you know Dennis too right you know Martina and Dennis Dennis is Martina's husband I know Martina and I know I, I know Becky uh I, do, I don't know Dennis no oh, okay all right um but last time when we had a had a chat you talked about the um taping that the uh kinesio taping which was really, really interesting. And so if anybody's interested in that webinar, I can't remember what number it is, but it's on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And um, uh, I, I think it's around the 40 or so. Yeah. <laughs> that seems like <laughs> ages ago now, doesn't it? The 40-ish. Yeah, it's, it's month now. I know, yeah. it's, time so, has been flying but by. Yeah, let me, let me see if I can have something uh, interesting <laughs> for Excuse all me. of you just to... That'd be great. Okay, and while you're doing that, I'm just going to see what other comments. Dennis Mesh, a racehorse. Rib. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't understand his name. I can ask Dennis um, who that was because that was really interesting. And I, there's another person from that talk that I've been getting in touch with. Um, okay, and I can always ask. Dennis about that. Um, so some people are are internet savvy and some people are um, not. And so well, actually, we're having thunderstorms here too tonight. So we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. Oh. Okay, let me see if I can have something for you, but I'm not sure because I I just cleaned all of my computers. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thursa, that's a really good idea. I've heard, I've not I've not met Thurza, but I know of Thurza. She was in New Zealand when I was there, and I just couldn't get to her workshop. But a friend of mine has uh, spent time with her, uh, and my spell check is acting weird. I have to go back into my external hard drive to see if there's something in there. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you're doing that. I'm just going to keep writing down names if my spell check will let me. Because um, I have that one thing I haven't figured out is how to get to the chat afterward to see the comments. And um, and then I always forget about it, so I don't do it. Um, um, you know how, who I could actually get for Liberty work is um, uh, um, drawing a blank. She's the woman in Costa Rica. Um, but Julian Benyon, if, if you did not see the Julian Benyon um, webinar, that's one really to go back and, and watch because he, that's why I had him. He's amazing and he worked for Cavalia and uh, um, really, really cares about the horses. And we started out with a video of his um, from Cavalia. So um, yeah, Julian was amazing. Wasn't he fun? He was really cool. It was a great webinar. All right, we're getting some great names. Okay, how you um, just Sybil, when you're ready, just tell me. I'll just keep working on the chat. In the yeah, I'm just trying to look if I can, because I might have some presentations that have nothing to do with the taping and the pads, but they're in Italian. So, oh, that's okay. You can translate them as you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can talk like half an hour about athletic conditioning if you want. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be awesome because okay. the person I'm trying to get for that one, she's, she's avoiding me right now. <laughs> athletic conditioning, <laughs> um, okay. athletic conditioning is a great topic. Well, actually, wait, I'm, uh, I mean, it's athle athletic conditioning just after the COVID lockdown. That was a presentation that I did for um, people here in Italy. So how do we, uh, I mean, what should we uh, take care of since most of the horses have been 
under-trained or even just stopped during the lockdown phase. Yeah, there's a lot of people that couldn't get to Barnes or if they could, they couldn't do anything. Exactly. And so I made a webinar, I mean, in Italian because I'm, that's my audience, but I can just translate it for you. Perfect. Uh, That'd be great. Oh, uh, Andrea Wadey, that was the name I was trying to think of. Um, uh, hi, Allie. Um, Bob's in a thunderstorm. So um, Sybil Mole is kindly filling in for Bob um, at, at an instant notice. Um, I, I swear there's, I, I, will, I will be doing webinars for the rest of my life because there's no end of really interesting people to talk to, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm trying to bring back the, um, the Equisoma, um, Diane Dezingle and um, Pamela Eckel Eckelberger, because I want them to talk about the thoracic spine. Um, and so I've already reached out to them because uh, that's fascinating. And Martina is going to be back. Martina Neardhart is back as a guest on the 20, I think it's the 29th. It's a Monday. Um, and she's going to talk about the horse's back. And there's a couple other people I'm trying to reach out to about that. So, um, so I'm, uh, I think okay, that I'm so ready. Much. When you want, I can share my screen. Okay. So, um, so folks, if you're just joining us, and I know some people are, the bad news is that um, Bob's uh, having a thunderstorm, and so he can't join us. I gave him 15 minutes, and he's unable to join in. So Dr. Sybil Mole from Italy um, was just tuning in, and so now we've recruited her to do a lecture on athletic conditioning for horses during the lockdowns. So take it away, Sybil. Yeah, it's just... Uh, okay, let me see. Okay, now it works. Can you yeah. see it? Yeah. Okay. And we can all so work in our Italian. Italian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All my slides are in Italian because that's what it was supposed to be. And it's a webinar that I gave, um, I think, a month ago or so uh, through my Facebook page because as Wendy, I just got crazy after webinars for a while because <laughs> I had to sit in front of my computer most of the day because we were in lockdown so actually this webinar was um, prepared on uh, athletic conditioning of the horse and exactly it was mostly uh, focused on the implications for the return into training after the um, COVID forced um, pose that most of the horses had in fact worldwide uh, and so, okay, so I'll just translate um, the slides for you. What's, what it's saying is that um, the training of a horse is made of uh, two components. One is learning, which is apprendimento, and the other one is athletic conditioning. And when you put the, these two things together, then you get into what we call the training. So what's the training for? It is used to reach the maximal potential, athletic potential of the, of the couple. And it has also the goal to reduce to the minimal um, amount the risk of injuries. So these are the two main goals of training. And within the training, we said we have learning. So the part that is more uh, related to uh, the horse learning how to do some tasks and then athletic conditioning, At athletic conditioning. Athletic conditioning is based on three fundamental principles that are uh, adaptation, progressive load and um, recovery, uh, rest, rest and recovery. Yeah, sorry. It's always well, I, I learned a tiny bit of Italian in the time I went there. They tried really hard to teach me. And so I was reading Cinderella in Italian to a little girl. And uh, she told me basta. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stop. Enough. <laughs> so these, are, <laughs> these are the three main principles of athletic conditioning. So what are going to be the structures that are involved within athletic conditioning? Is it going to be muscles, bones, uh, joints, uh, cardiovascular and respiratory systems, tendons and ligaments? If we talk first of all about muscles, um, we know that a muscle is made of a certain number of myofibrils, 
that are organized in fascicles that at the end compose the whole muscle. And what was really interesting is what we've seen with Martina that you were just um, naming before that showed us how much fascia is related to all of these interconnections. So, and, it, and it's what you see here almost everywhere surrounding all the little pieces. So when we talk about muscles, we have different type of muscle fibers. So we have the type one fibers that have a, a slow contraction and a, a metabolism that is mainly uh, based on aerobic, uh, aerobic. Um, and these are, I would say, the muscle fibers that will be, for example, affected by mostly by the action of the short foot pads, because it's the muscle, the fibers that compose uh, in, in the large majority the, the muscles that are, um, that, are that have the, the goal to maintain stability, uh, the, the, what do you call them, postural, postural muscles. Mm -hmm. And then we have the type one, the type two A and B fibers that are in fact the fibers that are responsible for the muscle contraction for the movement. Okay, so they have rapid contraction and the metabolism that might be anaerobic or mixed in between anaerobic and aerobic, depending on how we condition the muscle. And conditioning of a muscle mainly, where's my, my, arrow mainly um, acts on the proportion in between these two type of fibers okay in between the one two a and two b and we know that conditioning of a muscle is mainly the transformation of the two uh, two a fibers in two b and the deconditioning is going the other way around okay the important thing is to remember that the number and the type of muscle fibers within a subject is determined on a genetic base. base okay? A horse is born with a certain number of uh, type 1 and type 2 fibers, and it's not going to, and it's determined on his uh, genetic base. This is why it is so important to use some type of breeds compared to others for specific sports because the, com the um, composition of the muscle is genetically determined and this is why a certain type of muscle is more suitable to a certain type of sport activity, right? And we know that in the horse compared to other species, we have uh, mainly fibers of type two. So how do muscles adapt to training? So how do we condition a muscle? Uh, not by uh, an increase in number. So the number of fibers, we just said it is predetermined. So when we condition a horse, we are not changing the number of fibers that he has. We are changing the volume of the single fibers. We are making it bigger we are making it more performant, but we are not increasing the numbers. How do we reach this increase in uh, muscular capacity? Not only by the increase in volume of the muscle fibers, but also because we get um, an increase in uh, capillary perfusion. So the, horse, uh, the muscle gets more blood because it develops more um, capillaries. Because we increase the type 2A fibers through this mechanism of, um, um, how do you say that, uh, of um, evolution or of changing from the 2B to the 2A, right? Mm -hmm. And we increase the, the muscular capacity through some intracellular changes that are more, um, that the, the, um, displace the, the, the cellular metabolism to the, um, to the side of aerobiosis. And this is also seen because we increase what we call the VO2 max, which is the maximal intake volume uh, of oxygen that is intaken, I mean, inspired by the horse. Also, what is very important is that through training, not only we get an increase of the muscular capacity, so of the amount of work that a muscle is able to produce, but also 
we are refining the neuromotor control of the muscle. So the muscles are not only trained to be more powerful, they are also trained to be more precise, mm. which is something in which the short foot pads become in health because they help fine tuning of neuromotor control of the horse. I mean, when we put a horse on the short foot pads, we are forcing him to find a new way of balancing, to find a new way of perceiving his proprioception. And this is all um, included within what we call the fine tuning of muscle activity. Also, we are making the muscles uh, faster in their recruitment. So training a muscle is not making it only more powerful, it is also making it more performant in terms of uh, timing of contraction and fine tuning of neuromotor control. If we talk about bones, we know that we are able to condition bones too, uh, because bones are getting a constant remodeling that is consequent to the type of loads that they are um, that they are exposed to. Uh, one very mm, easy example of how bones remodel and not not necessarily in a positive way is what we have in very young thoroughbred racehorses that get box shins. Mm -hmm. So they, they get a lot of pain in the front of their cannon bones because the loads of training are exceeding the capacity of the bone to adapt without getting inflamed. So the bone needs a critical amount of stress, so of workload, to get remodeled uh, in order to be strong enough to afford the type of exercise that we are asking the horse to perform. On the other hand, the, the workload needs to be sufficient to cause a change, but not too much to cause an inflammation. So if we want to condition uh, a bone, we need to start early, but with caution. We need to work with, um, a tie, with gates that will be sport specific to what the horse has to do. So it makes no sense, for example, to have a racing thoroughbreds trotting for ages. He needs to canter. But he needs to start slowly and then progressively increase the, the, the intensity, which is the, the, the distance and the, and the speed. And it makes no sense, for example, to have a dressage horse doing a, a canter on up heels. He will never do that. His bones do not need that. So conditioning the bone needs to be sport specific. And then the thing is, we have to remember that we have to increase the workload for the bone every two weeks, because this is the time that it takes for the bone to respond to the stimulus we are giving. And this is what happens very often with um, racehorses particularly, is that they get stress fractures because the increase of workload is too fast compared to what the bone can, uh, can bear. So there are plenty of researchers that have showed that uh, the type of uh, footing, the, um, the amount of workload, the speed, the age, even the genetics influence the incidence of uh, stress fractures. And in this, if we want still to connect it to the use of the pads, pads, for example, might give us um, an idea if the horse is kind of trying to unload some areas of the limb, right? So right. knowing, for, if, if I think, for example, using the physio pads or even the, the, the blue, the, the soft pads, right? You can really put a horse on the pads with the two front feet and compare how much weight he's putting on one side and the other. And to me, for a young racehorse, for example, if there is a big difference in between the load of the two limbs, it means that something is going wrong in the way that he's, get, he's absorbing the training. And it might be that he's trying to um, unload his bones that might, be, um, that might need some more time to adapt. 
If we think about joints, uh, we also have the pos possibility to, um, to have an adaptation, so a conditioning of the joint uh, to train, uh, through training. Uh, the most important thing is we have to consider that not only we are um, influencing the, um, the cartilage, that is getting thicker in the areas that have more loads, but also we are influencing the um, quality, not really the amount, but the quality of the synovial fluid. So training is important, but it, it has a little bit the same guidelines of bones. It, it, joints need to be given the time to adapt to the workloads in order to, uh, to be um, in order for the conditioning to be effective and not detrimental. So that's just saying what I said. <laughs> uh, talking about tendon and ligaments, this is probably the most interesting part. Uh, so this is um, a reminder that tendon and ligaments have a similar uh, a structure, but a different function. Tendons are transmitting the energy from the muscle to the bone. And some of the tendons also have <clears throat> the capacity to store energy and release it to reduce the energy expenditure of movement. Ligaments have a different function. They are more stabilizers, right? And mainly they are stabilizing, stabilizing joints. So they are less elastic but still they are made of the, uh, I would say, the same cells, right? But with a different function. So we know that um, flexor tendons um, have a different percentage of lengthening depending on the gait that is actually uh, performed. So we know that at, at the walk, the lengthening of the flexors is 3% of their original length, and it gets up to 16.6% when we are talking about the canter. And another study has demonstrated that we have a break, I mean, the possible breaking of a tendon when uh, the, the strengthening, the um, lengthening is between 12 and 19%. So what happens is that when we have a horse cantering, we are already within that range that is possibly rupturing a tendon. It's not actually ha happening every time because otherwise we would have no horses able to canter. But this is why we have so many tendon lesions in equine uh, athletes. So we're and actually again, at the maximum in the canter, we're at the maximum of what that, that tendon can really do. And if we have any kind of... Um, uneven ground or slippery surface or something like that, we're increasing that potential for damage. Yeah, and even, I mean, you can have the perfect footing, uh, the perfect shoeing, everything, and then you have a little impairment in neuromotor control of the flexor muscles. This is reducing the compliance of the muscle, and it's adding maybe that 0.5% more stretch into the tendon, and then you have the tendon lesion. But Mostly, what has been seen is that the majority of the tendon lesions are actually chronic overload injuries, right? So it's not the single overstrain that would be within this range of 12 to 16 to 19 percent. Mainly, it is because uh, equine tendons are subject to this chronic overload. Um, that slowly, slowly lesions the tendon, or I would say that slowly, slowly makes the tendon less capable to withstand the percentage of stretch that it is um, uh, confronted to. Mm -hmm. And then it ends up into an acute lesion, but it has a chronic cause. Okay. So, and the very interesting thing is that tendon, tendons and ligaments are able to adapt only during uh, the growth. I mean, we know that a superficial digital flexor tendon is not conditioned anymore after two years of age. 
gets up to three years for the deep digital flexor tendon. But after that age, the tendons do not get any conditioning anymore. Whatever change in size is already a symptom of chronic overload. So it is very important that we get a proper conditioning of tendons and partly ligaments when the horse is growing, when it's a foal, when it's a yearling. So they have to stay out, stay in the pastures, play with other foals or yearlings, because after two years of age, there's no way that we are really, we are really conditioning the tendons anymore. Wow. So sometimes, I mean, as a vet, sometimes I meet people saying, oh, you know, uh, I have decided to breed my mare and it's going to be great because after she's falling, she's going to stay in the small paddock that is just corner at the end of the stables. And then you go and have a look at the paddock and it's a 10 meters per 10 meters paddock. And they pretend to have a young horse, a foal, and then a yearling that is going to grow in a paddock that is 100 square feet, uh, square meters. Wow. So it's like saying that you are having a kid that is going to grow until he's an adult just by staying in the dining room. Wow. So I didn't realize that, that basically all the conditioning of a ligament, of a tendon, uh, tendon and ligament, both of yeah, them? Yeah, tendon and ligament, yeah. Is, is done by the age of basically three. Yeah, I mean, then there is a lot that is going to be involved within the, the conditioning, but it's for the tendons mainly related to the muscle. So, so we are going to condition the muscle that is attached to the tendon. Right. So it's important that we have a muscle that is properly trained, fine-tuned in its neuromotor control because it's going to reduce a lot the stress and strain that is added to the tendon when the muscle doesn't function properly. But the idea that when you have a full, it's even more critical in those first three years that they are able to handle terrain and go out and run around and fall down and get up and do it again, because that's when they're going to condition those tendons and ligaments. Exactly. So there's no point when we can, where we can think that uh, a, a young horse can grow in a small pasture or in a small paddock. I mean, I know that this is not very use, use um, it's not very often that you see something like that in the US because you have plenty of space. Right. But in Europe, it might happen. And in Italy, I can tell you there are lots of crazy people that breed mares that were previous uh, sport horse mares that might have great genetics and all of that stuff. And then they just forget that the foals need to run and need to go around. It's changing. And most of the time now people have learned that they need to find the right places to have their um, youngsters to grow, but it's not always like that. So it's very important that we keep in mind that horses up to two years need to have plenty of space to condition their tendons and then because they have to learn proprioception and they have to learn social life too, if it's possible being with other horses. So, does, the, um, does the terrain also matter at this point? In other words, there's a lot of horses that are born on really flat ground and never see a hill um, until they're maybe sold or moved. Like I'm thinking of like Florida or, or Holland where it's so flat. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the more, I mean, but this is probably more uh, something that has to do with their learning of, um, I mean, their proprioceptive learning, right? Knowing right, how as to opposed to the actual size of the tendon. I don't think it's going to have a, I mean, the tendon is especially related to the amount of stretch that they have at walk, trot, and canter, right? Obviously, the more various, okay, their experience is in terms of um, movement, the better it will be, right? 
the more proprioceptive awareness they have of everything, including uphill, downhill, um, um, stones on the on the on their path or stuff like this, the better it is. But to me, the most important thing is that they are able to walk, trot, and canter at a, a sufficient speed and at a, in a and for a sufficient uh, distance to kind of condition the, the tendons and ligaments. Okay. Because especially the tendons, and still I can tell you there are so many horses that have been growing up in great places and then they still break. So that's the thing. I mean, that's the sport. Unfortunately, we can do nothing for that. So, how do we prevent um, injuries once the tendon is got, arrived to full growth? We need to make sure that we are uh, working with appropriate, appropriate workloads, that we are keeping the muscles elastic. So again, it's very important that not only, I mean, the body has to be considered as, as a whole. So we cannot think about conditioning a muscle without conditioning a tendon, a bone, a joint. It goes all together. The problem is that some loads that are more efficient for structures, for a structure, might be too much for another one. So we, we need to try to kind of find a balance in between all of this. And then it's very important, uh, the shoeing, the um, type of... Um, footing, I mean, or arenas and uh, outside trails and stuff like that. So these are the main four points that will be involved in to, um, I would say, tendon conditioning after two years old. Although I don't think it's a real conditioning. It's more a kind of training. Anyway, uh, so talking about cardiovascular system, we have to remember that heart is a muscle and it's going to respond to training by increasing its volume, so hypertrophy. This is going to bring to a, an increase of contractile strength and also an increase of ventricular volume. So not only the heart is becoming stronger in terms of pumping effic efficiency, but also it's becoming more efficient in terms of volume of blood that it can um, fill, with which it can fill, and then it can. So it, these like two capacity. things yeah. together um, bring an increase in what we call cardiac output. Obviously, within cardiovascular system, we also have um, an adaptation of um, blood vessels with, as we said, an increase in uh, number of capillaries in muscles, but also the blood adapts to training. So all, we, we also have a conditioning of the composition of blood where we have an increase in plasmatic volume and an increase in number and volume of um, red blood cells, right? So we see that a lot of things respond to conditioning. What about respiratory system? It does not adapt to training. I mean, we have a change in, respira in respiration, in breathing, when a horse is, is doing some kind of exercise, even ourselves. I mean, if I run to catch the bus, for sure, if I get the bus, which is not sure, uh, then I will probably will have um, an increased uh, respiration rate. But this is not, I mean, the, the, um, the change in respiration rate is not an adaptation of the respiratory system. It is a reflex to an increased request from the bloodstream, from the blood flow, from the muscles. There's no way that the capacity of the, the lungs do not change with training. The capacity you have is the one you have. You cannot increase it. You can decrease it. If you smoke, if you have an allergy, if you have asthma, you can decrease it, but you cannot increase it. So you cannot condition it. 
Huh. And all the changes in the respiratory system are a consequence of the cardiovascular and muscular adaptations to training. That's fascinating. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to Equitana and S in Germany, but um, there's a doctor there, uh, uh, Dr. Enda, and he ha um, ha has a horse, a, a live, well, not live, it's dead, but he has a real horse's lungs. And he, and he has the guts floating around in pools. He has all these things. It's really, and then they have hot dogs at the end of the Essen, the whole thing in his, in his space. That's another story. But the, the, when you see the size of a horse's lungs filled with air, they're massive. Yeah, and it's huge. Huge, so huge. I don't think you can really appreciate it until you've actually seen that. I have a photograph somewhere. Maybe I can dig it out and post it because they're just absolutely enormous. Yeah, and the thing is, the fact that the respiratory system cannot be conditioned or reconditioned is the reason why it is so important that we really pay attention that our horses do not get any type of compromise of their respiratory system. Because this is not going to be something that we can solve. I mean, once a horse has COPD, or IAD or all the very nice acronyms they use for respiratory conditions, then it has an impairment of its athletic capacity. There's no way that we, we can compensate it with training and with conditioning. And then finally, um, also behavior adapts to um, training and so it can be conditioned and we know that many horses will um, adapt their behaviors um, to the requests of the rider, which most of the time, if you do all good and the horse has no problem, means you train him and it gets the super horse that does whatever you want when you're just thinking about it. Adaptation of behavior to training and conditioning can also be you're doing something wrong or I'm in pain and I don't want, and I'm showing you a misbehavior. So it goes in both directions. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, the goal is to adapt behavior to a proper training and to a proper conditioning. So again, we said that con athletic conditioning is based on um, three fundamental principles that are adaptation, progressive load, um, rest and recovery. So I'm going quick That's fine. through this. Yeah. So talking about adaptation, we know that um, uh, we need, um, sorry, I, I just need to see what I have to translate for you. Okay, yeah. We're working Adapt on our Italian while you're doing this, right? Because you're speaking to us and we're reading. So this is great, at least for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm trying to. But if you want, I can, I can read in Italian, talk to you in, in, in English, and then translate it to French. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, we know that adaptation is, in fact, the, the response to microtrauma in terms of a reparative response. So, every time we are increasing the workload, load, we are causing a microtrauma. And... The, the healing of this microtrauma is the adaptation. Progressive load means that we have to give the horse a certain load of work that gives him the time to adapt, but also that has sufficient in terms of intensity and time to cause the adaptation, so to cause the microtrauma. So we can talk about uh, right and wrong loads. So a right load, or workload, is a workload that causes a microtrauma and then through rest and recovery, we have an adaptation. A wrong load is a, uh, a workload that causes a microtrauma where we do not give the time to the body to adapt and this will lead to a restriction and an alteration of movement. Consequently, it has a proprioceptive adaptation 
and it ends up within a compensation. And this makes me think of a, a very of the very interesting um, cascade of uh, events that Sherry Johnson talked about in her first webinar, the one that you did a lot of time ago. We were at the beginning of the lockdown, and she gave a very interesting um, description of the cascade of injury. I, I don't remember how she called it, but it was really, really interesting because it really was giving the kind of um, succession of what happens and how you you need to stop this cascade at some point to get out of the chronic injuries in particular. If we talk about rest and recovery, so rest does not mean the horse is shot in his stall. The rest means that you, we are not repeating the workload. So we are going to, we, I mean, the horse can rest without standing still. Rest might also be just loading different structures. So like one day we are going to work uh, uphill to work to load some type of muscles. And then the other day we are working on fine tuning of some muscle exercises, right? So loading different structures is a form of, of rest. Rest means I'm not loading the same structure all the time. And this is particularly important if we think about tendons, because we know that tendon injuries are a result of chronic overload. So this means we can prevent a lot of tendon injuries by just making a more vari uh, by just making more variations into the work of a horse. Okay, maybe I'll just skip. So the, the phase of work are um, warm up that is needed to increase uh, the temperature of the muscle and optimize the aerobic capacity of the, um, of the muscle. Uh, cool down is, you, you call it cool down, yeah, warm up, cool down. Yep. Cool down is as much important as warm up because it is what you need to bring back the, um, the um, body to its resting condition, right? So you cannot pretend that you're getting a horse out of his stall and then you just start working very fast and then you're, you're done and you put him back into his stall. I can tell you you're going to have trouble at some point of the life and not very, very, uh, and it's going to happen quickly. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, so what are the, um, genetic, the, the factors that influence the athletic conditioning, it's based on intrinsic factors that are mainly genetics. We said that the number of fibers is genetically determined, but it's a lot of things that's within the genetics. It's confirmation, it's um, uh, behavior even that has some kind of basic uh, genetic basis, and it's age. But mostly what is going to influence the athletic condition is what we call the extrinsic factors. So it's the type and amount of work. The rider, you have shown many times how much the rider is going to influence the horse. The um, uh, shoeing, we've been talking for that in lots of your webinars, and also the um, uh, tuck, tucking, no, how do the you call that? Yeah. Tuck, tuck, yeah. Uh, the a type of footing where the horse is working. The climate has a very important uh, effect on athletic conditioning. It's very different, different having a horse exercises in exercising, for example, in uh, uh, hot, humid weather compared to uh, cold and, um, and dry. Yeah. And obviously, um, nutrition has a very important uh, effect on athletic conditioning. So athletic conditioning and the application of its principles have uh, as a goal to obtain the maximal expression, uh, the maximal functional and athletic expression of a subject. The important thing is to have a program as for everything in life. Voila. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Um, so it, it does bring up some questions. 
the first one I'm going to ask is, you know, people talk about turning fat into muscle. You'll hear that all the time. I, you know, about you can't turn fat into muscle, but that's an expression that uh, when I was growing up, that was very common to talk about. So let me see. Where uh, I'm just looking at, at the questions in the chat. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I cannot. Okay, when we, when we probably, when we talk about turning fat into muscle, it's because, in fact, when the muscle gets conditioned to use um, a more uh, aerobic uh, uh, metabolism, in fact, it uses the fats to produce energy because fats are the most efficient source of energy but it can only be used by the oxidative uh, pathways. So you need a conditioning of the muscle where the cells change their metabolic activity, switching it to the more oxidative ways and use the fats to produce energy. And this is probably where you think that you are turning the fats into muscles. So it's, That's, it's I think the oxidative process to use the energy of the fat to build the muscle. It's, you know, not, and, and a lot of people, I know people sometimes get confused. They'll look at a horse and go, oh, he's so well muscled. And really what they're looking at is a lot of fat pads. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Sorry. Yeah. I was just reading the questions. I lost you for That's a okay. second. Yep. Um, so, uh, okay. We did have one back here about cross training. I don't know if you saw that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to because there are lots of obviously lots of people saying, "Oh, we have changed." Uh, <laughs> change speaker. Yes, yeah. um, Bob's had a thunderstorm. His internet's knocked out, um, and Dr. Moy has been so kind to fill in and give us a, a very informative lecture about training. Um, it brings up a lot of questions for me. Um, okay, okay. Including different modalities. modalities. In example, heel work for dressage horses is not valuable. So, Why not? Well, what you said, I, th that question came up when you were talking in the beginning of your talk about... Okay, you yeah. No, I didn't mean that heel work is not valuable. I mean, it doesn't make sense to have a dressage horse have a canter uphill at 700 meters per second, which is not the work that he's supposed to do. Which doesn't mean that you should not do it, although I don't think a dressage course is exactly <laughs> programmed to run that fast. They can, but I'm not sure this is what you need from them. But this doesn't mean he'll work. I mean, I ha I, I'm uh, having a... Um, lot of uh, dressage horses that just go and work outside in the countryside and they do heel work and they do lots of uh, things that you would for example mostly expect from an eventing horse but obviously whatever can help training their proprioception and sometimes just going to do a work on the heels is good for their mental health i was going to say we have to think about not only the the muscles that we're training, but also the mental and emotional health. And then if you're constantly just going into a dressage arena and grinding way on a 20 meter circle, that doesn't do anything for your mental health. Um, yeah. so cross training, uh, I think of it as a way to, to you, could still, you could still do your canter parts in a grassy field on a slight slope, um, in addition to doing them in the arena, because that's going to change your proprioception. It's still working on a similar task, but you change an environment and a footing, and it and it's a different environment for the nervous system to have to cope with. Yeah, and for sure, I mean, it's important to make the work of the horses as uh, variable as possible. I mean, the more experience their body and their proprioceptors and the, their muscles and whatever have um, is good. What we have to keep in mind that then for more, um, I would say, sport-specific tasks, they need to make to perform it in a more standardized condition, right? So I wouldn't, for example, go out in the fields and try to do a uh, canter pirouettes. 
because that's pro or not at the very beginning. I mean, if you have a dressage horse and you want to take him out, start with just a hack and then you might add slowly a little bit of trot uphill, downhill. Most of the time, the problem with dressage horses is that many dressage riders say, oh, I don't like to trot or make a, like a little gallop or a canter with the horse downhill because then they go um, too much on their front limbs, too much on their shoulders. I mean, I think that if a horse has a good balance, even if he goes cantering downhill, he's not going to go on his shoulders. Right. And, and we have to take in, I mean, there's so many factors there. You have to take in the steepness of the slope, the level of fitness of the horse um, before you just rush off and canter down a hill. Um, yeah. And so um, there's a progression in the training. And, and one of the things that I've always heard in, in progressive training is that you have to, um, you have to condition the bones. Well, it used to, the, you thought used to be like the ligaments, tendons, and bones, and that's your long, slow distance. And then you gradually increase your intensity and decrease your duration. Is that still? Uh, well, it makes sense. Although, in fact, you still need a certain amount of duration to provide the sufficient stimulus, especially to the muscles and the cardiovascular system. And then the increase in intensity, you have to make sure it's not exceeding also that micro trauma area. So, and every, I mean, most of the time, my answer when it, I mean, it's, there are a ton of possible answers. And I think that the real, um, the, the most true answer is the one that each single individual horse gives to mm. his rider. Yeah. So someone's asked what the ratio of walk, trot, and canter is, re what, what's recommended during a light, medium, and heavy day of work. But I think you just answered it. It, it really depends on the individual. Um, the only thing that has to remain, uh, I would say, standardized or standard is the time of warm up and of cool down. So, if you are living in a very warm weather, it might be enough to warm up the horse for like five, ten minutes at very at walk and uh, little jogging, right? So trotting very slow. Obviously, if it's, uh, I don't know how much it is in Fahrenheit, but if you are at minus 10 degrees Celsius, uh, it Low will freezing. You're probably about for sure need to take longer to warm up the horse. And same thing is um, when you cool them down, it, it has to be um, almost one third of the work that you have been work, I mean, the, the, the one third of the time that you have been working. So if you are working for one hour, it takes 20 minutes to cool the horse, cool the horse down. Oh, that's okay. It's not just waiting that he has stopped breathing as a, um, as a, mm -hmm. um, heavily. Crazy. So he needs to, and cooling down means not just walking. It might be like trot. It might even be, I mean, um, for a racehorse, cool down might be a little trot. Uh, it, it's not necessarily uh, going very slow. It might, it might also be trying to get back to some sort of suppleness, right? It's whatever is not high intensity work, which is... So I've been told that trot is actually the better gait to, to cool a horse down for a certain period of time, obviously, because at some point you're going to come back to walk, but the, an aerobic trot, <laughs> um, is, it a, is it an easy way to cool them down because it's, it's low effort, but um, still has a fair amount of volume, I guess, air volume to move lactic acid out of the muscles. Is that right? It's, I mean, it's related to two components. One is the fact that it's uh, still, a, a, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a lower metabolic activity compared to canter and also because it's a symmetric gait, mm. right? So if you wanted to 
cool down a horse at even a slow canter, for example, you would need to change the lead. I mean, you cannot do it only on the left or only on the right canter, maybe for like 10 minutes, right? And the problem is that then I think, I believe at least, um, that there is a mental component that gets into that. Some horses, when you ask them to change the lead of the canter, it still works for them. Mm -hmm. So cooling down is not only for the body, it's also for the brain. The horse has to know that he did a good job and he can start to disconnect. Right. It's a little bit like when we go home at night and then we switch the TV on and we just listen to what's happening, not really understanding what they say. I mean, that's the news usually for me. <laughs> <laughs> I had another question. It came and went from my mind. Um, does anybody have any questions for, for Dr. Moy? Um, we'll see if I, I had another question in there. I have to think if it'll come back. Um, oh, no, it's gone. Um, so it wasn't important. I guess not. I, it was there and I was, and I forgot it. But, um, so, so, oh, I know what it, what it, like if we're, so you were saying that this was a lecture for people that have horses have kind of been mothballed during COVID and you're about to start bringing your horse back into work. How long do they maintain their condition? In other words, what's that? Like if, if I put my horse up today and he was in full work, how long will he maintain that level of condition or how quickly does it drop off? Yeah, perfectly got it. Uh, so it is considered that horses keep their, I would say cardiovascular and muscular conditioning for up to 12, 16 weeks, which means that to obtain, I mean, if you have a horse that is um, perfectly fit, right. okay, competing, top condition, right? Racehorse. And you stop him abruptly. He, it will need three to four months to get back to a zero condition. Wow. And this is the most difficult thing to handle with when you have horses in rehab. Because they're Cause still fit. Because they're still fit. And so they're still stupid sometimes. Right. Well, they're, yeah, they're used to that kind of high level of activity. And it's like taking a, a person and saying, okay, now you're going to lay on the couch after being and in. Exactly. And this is the most difficult thing to deal with when you have a horse that has an injury. Because they go from having a certain amount of training daily to probably being just shot in the, in the stall, cannot get out at all. And they get totally crazy. Plus all the problems that they might have with guts and right. that sort, sort of things. So it is considered that total muscular and cardiovascular deconditioning that are strongly related one to each other take approximately three to four months. And by complete, I mean getting back to the day you were born. I mean, to nothing, right? right. Um, if we think about bones, there's not really a time. I mean, you do not decondition completely bones. Although there is a study that was made in Kentucky, I think, where they checked what was happening um, with horses that were put in a cast, right? So there are two studies. One was related to bone mineral density. And, uh, but I do not, now I do not really remember exactly what were the results, but I think that they demonstrated that total uh, stop for like eight weeks was causing um, um, critical decrease in bone mass that needed a retraining for safe use of the horse, right? And then there is another one that was made um, with, uh, that was related to joint motion, right? Um, and uh, they were having the horses casted for eight weeks, no, for seven weeks, and then they were getting back into training and having regular work, and they were doing biomechanical analysis of, analysis of the horse movement, and they have seen that 
only with work without specific exercises and uh, specific uh, stimulation for proprioceptive retraining, the horses were never getting back to the original joint range of motion mm. in the limb that was casted. So that has also to take in, to be taken into account. That's the, the study that was on which um, Dr. Hillary Clayton based her studies on proprioceptive uh, facilitation techniques. Okay, so so if you have a horse with an injury, you you could kind of say that you you need to, and it's like people, you need to do something specific to rehab that injury, or they are not going to regain full function. Just because I mean, of this is what we know. This is what we know from uh, pain and lameness. I mean, uh, we were talking about it also with Martina. I think sometimes you have a lameness. You solve the cause of the lameness, but still the horse does not get back to function. Right. And this is related mostly to fascia and proprioception. Right. So anything we can do like surefoot pads to rehab the proprioception so that we regain the function. And For sure. That, that was exactly my experience when I had the surgery two years ago when they, um, they went to take out a bone spur from my original injury and found out that glute medius only had 25% of the tendon attached. So they, <laughs> they put two screws into the greater trochanter and stitched up into the tendon and reattached it. And I, I, it, take, it took, it's two years for me to gain, regain, you know, I wouldn't say full function, but you know, I'm mostly back to, to normal, but it took two years to regain that from that surgery. So yeah, for horses, if we think if we think about uh, metabolic activity, they can keep it for quite a long time. And uh, I think that uh, I mean the the COVID lockdown was just long enough long enough to get us in troubles. Okay, so so um, uh, Joyce Harmon, oh, Dr. Harmon always used to tell me that the enzymes, the muscle enzymes, are there for about six weeks, but maybe yeah, that's where you start to see a decrease, right? But to, to and and it's and it's correct. So after six weeks, you have a decrease in the muscle capacity. After twelve weeks, you are at zero. Right, but that's a lot and longer. And then if yeah. a horse is turned out in a field, does that, that would change that situation because he's in motion, because he's- For moving. sure, yeah. And, and the big thing was, I mean, you know, in every place and in every stables, the horses were managed differently mm. during the COVID. I mean, in some stables, they were still ridden, so it didn't change anything except from the fact they reduced the intensity of the work. Maybe they were not jumping or they were not doing some uh, for the dressage horses, like the doing the, the tests. Right. Not preparing for the show. Okay. In some other places, uh, I think about, I mean, here in Italy, we had some areas where people could not reach the, to their horses in any way. And so the stable owners had to take care maybe of 30 or 40 horses. And maybe there were just two or three people, and that's a lot. Um, and uh, and maybe those horses were just like walked in the horse walker for half an hour or an hour, just turned out in the paddock. But we know that it all depends on the paddock. I mean, if they have acres of paddocks where they can run free and get crazy and play and do whatever, probably they do not get any type of deconditioning. But if we talk about a paddock that is 50 square meters, I mean, where it's big as our living room. Yeah. I mean, they were obviously happier than being just shot in their stall, but it doesn't it's give not, anything to their It's condition. only helping their mental facility. It's not helping. Exactly. It's helping, it's helping their brain, but it's not helping their body. I mean, it's much more um, effective efficient from a conditioning standpoint to have them walk for an hour in the walker than to stay the whole day in a small paddock. Right. Um, someone's asked a question here. If your horse has an injury which didn't have specific rehab at the time, how much scope is there to improve things later? Do we need to focus on proprioception first and then 
the the case. I think she probably means the cause. And this kind of relates to a question I was, that I, I remembered what it was, um, that a lot of these tendon injuries that you're describing, and it seems that we're finally realizing that a lot of the tendon injuries are chronic injuries that finally have an acute phase. Exactly. That's um, what it is. Yeah. I mean, that's the point where they got after years of research is that it's chronic overload that has just an acute um, uh, way of showing up, but it's, it's chronic. Uh, so if a horse that hasn't had a specific rehab at the time of an injury, I think that the best is to have the horse evaluated from a functional standpoint to make sure that his proprioception and its muscle control are appropriate because he might have just retrained to the right point or maybe not. But to prevent a re-injury, you have to make sure that the horse is loading evenly on all limbs, uh, that it's moving in the, the appropriate way. Um, and then for a certain percentage, you just need to cross your fingers that nothing is going to happen. Okay. Uh, luck is within the rehab process. Okay, about wrapping. Okay, so there is a very interesting study. I can write you there. This is the reference. For the wrapping question? Yeah, for the wrapping question. I'll just read it so people know what we're talking about. What about wrapping, supporting weakened flexor tendon, affected from slippage in the field, and lightly riding? Um, so the article that I just cite you there from Ramon, Ramon and uh, other authors that was published in 2004, it's on athletic taping of the fetlock, uh, has showed that even with athletic taping, that is, if, it's rigid, so it's even more than wrapping. The extension of the fetlock does not change at all. So, and so it means that whatever wrap you want to put around your horse leg to prevent overextension of the fetlock and to prevent any type of whatever thing you think might happen to your tendon, it's not going to be effective. Because if athletic taping cannot prevent the limb to overextend, I don't think a wrapping, even if it's very supportive, it's not going to do anything. But it is going to alter the proprioceptive, uh, the proprioception of the horse. So I'm not sure whether it's going to be good or not. And this is exactly what they have demonstrated in this article is that it was not preventing hyperextension of the fetlock. It was reducing um, fetlock flexion during the flight arc, so the uh, swing phase. And it was reducing the ground reaction forces. So, in fact, the amount of load that the horse was putting on the limb. Yeah, and I, I think um, if, if anybody um, wants to see... Um, when we started Dennis's lecture yesterday, his talk yesterday, there was a piece of video that I played, which was slow motion movement of the horse. And when you see that slow motion load on the, when the foot lands and the load comes onto the leg, the degree that the fetlock drops, you're gonna realize that there isn't anything that we have that's gonna be able to sustain that fetlock because we can't, we, there's no way we can support it in that direction. Anything- Except the past yeah, can't support the way the weight's coming down into the fetlock. Um, I would think that trimming and shoeing would be really important in a horse like that <laughs> to make sure that the- I, not... I have a plan. If I can demonstrate something, we'll talk about it in a couple of years. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, because that's, um, that was one of the things I know when the, like all these boots came out for horses and you know they were supposed to be supportive boots, but- um, they, they weren't. I'm retyping the reference. So the article is from Ramon, uh, uh, 2004. And the article is on athletic taping of Fetlock. I don't remember the exact title. I hope that Diane can see it now. Okay. Um, and so somebody's asked a question. 
Uh, uh, any thoughts on free lunging and groundwork versus riding to bring a horse into condition? Free lunging? Meaning um, they're, in a, they're in a field or a paddock. No, no, just say, say the question again. Oh, um, uh, oh, hang on a second. I got to get back to it because I like Because like <laughs> I cannot see some of the questions. I think oh, that's... That is... Yeah, it's in the Q&A. Um, any thoughts on free lunging slash groundwork versus riding to bring a horse into condition? So it's, it's in the Q&A as opposed uh, to... I found it now. Yeah. I found it. Okay. Um, I think that it's three, I mean, it's two different type of work. So alternating it is for sure very useful. Uh, I think that, it, I, I mean, lunging a horse or riding it, it's, it's not, um, I mean, the difference is in the amount of work, in the intensity of work, not, not in how you do it. I mean, we have standard breads that never get ridden, right? but still they are conditioned. And Most of the time we are starting the conditioning of a young horse only on the launch line because he's not able to be ridden yet. So it's not the way you do it. It's what you're doing, the amount of workload that you're adding. So in terms of time, in terms of speed, in terms of type of gait. Do, don't you also think that um, the, the quality, in other words, I've seen people work their horse in a round pen, the horse is going around like a motorcycle in deep footing, which to me is stressful versus having a horse on a lunge line where he's kept upright and the person's moving, so he's not just stuck in a tight circle. I mean, the, 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 there we're going to get into the quality of the work, of the training. Yeah, for sure. But that's the luck of the single horse, if they have a better or a worse trainer. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, I mean, the quality of the work, for sure, is going to have an effect, or I would say, the, the better the work is done, the less likely it is that the horse is going to get injured. Right. And that's, but that's one of the because of the quality and the, and the way that you are asking the horse to move. And yeah, obviously if you have the horse in the round pen going boo, yeah. 200 kilometers per hour, it's obviously more likely that he's going to get injured compared to a horse that is launched on the double launch or right. And, and um, you know, so many people want to say that one training method is a is better than another training method. But I think Arthur Cotta said it best. Arthur Cotta is Heidelberg from he was the first chief rider at the Spanish Riding School for forty years, and he said there's good training and there's bad training, and it's not the st the type of training or the style or the equipment. It's how you apply it. It's you know, do you train? Sure well or do you train badly are you paying attention to the horse's balance or are you just letting him fall over um and i think that the quality is really what it comes down to in the end in terms of injury prevention as well as uh, athletic performance yeah for sure and i think that you can have two persons that use the same method with a different way of reading the horse response and it becomes that the same method is good or bad yes Yes. So, yeah, there's so many factors and, and we, you know, and the things that we each notice individually and also that individual horse to, to whether or not the result. And that's why for me, you know, I look at someone, how many horses do they have reaching a high level versus the person who gets one horse there? Um, is, are they consistent? And if they're consistent, that there's something about their training that's producing consistent results. Exactly. So then you start to look at what, what is their training program. And then of course it's how you would apply it to your own horses. But it's, it's complicated in the end. <laughs> For sure. I mean, it's, uh, I, I very sometimes, I, I like very much sometimes the definition that they give of um, equestrian sport. It's the sport where sometimes the material decides not to cooperate. <laughs> yeah. 
That's very true. And for the and for sure, people. yeah, a tennis, a tennis racket or a, a, a pair of ski uh, does not have a soul to decide not to cooperate. The horses have. Yeah. And, um, and only sport dogs can be compared to what we are leaving as equestrian athletes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, th this, I cannot thank you enough for filling in because this has been a really educational webinar. And um, so I'm, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm not unhappy because I'll get Bob anyway. I know he's, uh, you know, we're going to just reschedule him. And Yeah, you have to reschedule him because yeah. I want to see, to hear what he has to say. <laughs> yep, so I will definitely reschedule him. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Mole, for filling. This has just been great. It's another great piece of the puzzle for everybody. Um, just everybody, remember, you can find all of the webinars on my Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And if you um, want to register for any of the other webinars, I'm now posting them on the calendar on the Surefoot Equine website. So if you go to surefootequine.com and go to the calendar, you can click on the day. It'll bring up the person. Just click on that. And then you can register right from there um, for the for the webinars. And um, tomorrow, uh, I've got I've lost. Track. Oh, tomorrow is Dr. Mark Riley, and we're going to talk about using Surefoot in practice in veterinary practice. So that should be an interesting. Okay. One. Yeah, I have to register for that one. Yeah, it's at six o'clock at night though, so it might be kind of late for you. Um, but we'll have it. Yeah, I'll probably I'll try to stay up until <laughs> that time. And if not, I'll just go and have a look to the one registered. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And I'll let you all know when we um, get Bob back. And have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Wendy. Bye. Thanks, Sybil. It was awesome. <laughs>